So HLH is a disorder of immune regulation in which um, certain types of immune responses become dangerously strong and they cause damage uh, to the body. And physicians can recognize HLH by recognizing a, a, a specific pattern of damage that we can see in patients that have this disorder. So uh, patients with HLH um, uh, are um, quite varied. So uh, historically, it was recognized that uh, very young children, usually infants, that uh, perhaps uh, came from families with other children that were affected by HLH would develop this disorder without any obvious sort of cause, a, any sort of uh, infection that may be sort of uh, triggering the HLH. But it was also recognized that there were older children, maybe grade school age, uh, teenagers, and we recognize now even adults uh, that may develop HLH. Uh, and uh, in those situations, uh, historically, it was recognized that there was uh, less, um, less likely that they would come from families where other individuals were affected with HLH. It was also more common that uh, these individuals would have um, a strong infection, such as EBV, that might be associated with sort of setting off the HLH. Uh, alternatively, they could have a malignancy, such as a lymphoma or leukemia, that could actually have triggered the HLH. Uh, or they could have a rheumatologic disorder, such as uh, GIA or juvenile idiopathic arthritis, that is was sort of the context in which the HLH arose. Uh, and uh, so it was recognized historically that there is a wide um, uh, range of patients, and they sort of naturally fell into these two categories. But that was really, uh, that classification was developed before the modern era of genetic testing. And now with genetic testing, what we find is that, uh, as expected, most infants with HLH do, in fact, have a, a definable genetic cause. So in other words, they're born with a, with a certain set of genetic abnormalities that predispose them to developing HLH. Uh, in a very serious sort of way. Uh, but we're finding more increasingly that older children and even adults, in fact, also have genetic uh, problems that predispose them to develop HLH. The only real difference uh, for many of these patients is that a lot of these uh, mutations appear to be milder in the individuals that don't get sick until they're, until they're older. So um, I, I, it's my personal opinion that I, I think this division between primary and secondary HLH is really not very helpful because the, the, the dividing line has gotten very blurred. Uh, it's true that there are children of all ages that we, uh, we can't define uh, definitely what the genetic cause is. But uh, you know, based on your age, even if you're, uh, the child is older, they, they may in fact still have a, uh, the same kind of genetic causes that young children have. Uh, but you'll still see this terminology. It's very widely used. Uh, and uh, but like I said, I, it's my personal opinion. I'm, I'm not sure how helpful that is. Now, in the case of adults with HLH, as I already mentioned, there are some adults uh, that, um, in fact, do have genetic uh, abnormalities that we think predispose them to develop HLH. Uh, but it's also true that um, the likelihood of having other situations um, or circumstances such as an undiagnosed uh, malignancy uh, or a rheumatologic disorder uh, is um, the probability of that is probably increasingly higher the older uh, the individual is when they first develop HLH. Uh, so it's really more of a continuum. Uh, and I would think uh, like to describe it as uh, individuals with very severe mutations get sick at an early age, and that's the sort of the classic uh, primary HLH. Individuals with uh, milder mutations, uh, they may get sick uh, older and they may fall somewhere in the middle. And individuals with even very mild mutations may develop HLH under the right circumstance. So for instance, it's, it's increasingly clear that individuals that uh, develop um, uh, HLH known, as, uh, known by the terminology as MAS, which is another discussion, but uh, that develop HLH in the context of rheumatologic uh, disorders such as JIA, uh, that many of those patients, in fact, actually have mild mutations that are the same sort that we see in infants with, with classic primary HLH. So uh, there's really a continuum, uh, and I think that adults with HLH are at one end of the spectrum and infants are at the other, but it's difficult to draw um, uh, definite lines between these, these groups of individuals. So uh, if somebody is an, uh, is an adult, uh, I tend to encourage referring physicians to look extra hard for these additional associations because we know the chances of there being something else going on in this patient besides just HLH. Uh, are higher in an older individual. So I encourage them to look very, very carefully for uh, infections, 
uh, look very, very carefully for malignancies uh, and any other sort of rheumatologic diagnosis that could perhaps be uh, an underlying cause of the HLH. So when patients first are diagnosed with HLH, as, uh, as I mentioned, there's a certain pattern of damage that's occurring in the body that allows physicians to recognize the, the syndrome as HLH. Uh, the, it's really like things are on fire, right? So the, the immune system, uh, the immune response is um, extremely strong, very damaging, and, and causing all sorts of problems. So, so really what, what you start with is like a fire extinguisher. You need to put out this flame. Uh, and uh, um, by, simply by trial and error over the last 30 years, uh, uh, you know, physicians have found that uh, there are certain sorts of regimens that actually work well for controlling these damaging immune responses. Uh, and in fact, the thing that is that I would consider, that most people consider the standard of care for the treatment of HLH is a combination of two medications. That, uh, one is dexamethasone, which is an anti-inflammatory corticosteroid uh, combined with another medication called etoposide which is a chemotherapeutic drug, uh, but it turns out that chemotherapeutic drugs are also very good immune suppressive medications. And, and for reasons that are still not entirely clear, this particular chemotherapeutic drug is particularly good at controlling the dangerous inflammation that we see in HLH. Uh, and so the, um, the, uh, this regimen uh, uh, incorporating these two medications, dexamethasone and etoposide, has been tested in two international worldwide trials over the last 15 or uh, almost 20 years now. Uh, and so that's why most people feel that, uh, that this is really the standard of care, this regimen. Uh, and, um, uh, but there are all, also alternative ways to treat uh, HLH. So as, as we mentioned, this is a, a problem of immune regulation. And so there are alternative forms of immune suppression consisting of, principally consisting of uh, antibodies that destroy T cells, which are the main sort of troublesome cells in this, in this process. Uh, and there are medications either called ATG or alemtuzumab uh, that, that uh, can also be therapeutic for treating patients with HLH. So there's currently a, a, a trial that we're conducting in North America, and, but also a, a, a sister trial in Europe to look at a combination of antibodies against uh, T cells combined with etoposide to see if uh, we can come up with a more intelligent combination of approaches that, that may uh, be more effective at treating patients with HLH. So there's, so there's really two phases, right, for treating of HLH. So the patient shows up, they're, um, they are, uh, they're sick, uh, and so you need to uh, control the, uh, the inflammation so put out the fire, right? So once that uh, has been achieved, then the next step or the next phase of treatment for HLH is uh, a permanent cure. So we, uh, we know that if patients have um, uh, severe mutations uh, in certain genes, then uh, they are uh, predisposed to developing HLH. So they may develop it once. And if you get control of that um, uh, process with uh, immune suppressive medications, then uh, they may be fine for a while, but then it will come back again and uh, potentially again and again. And each time it's, uh, it's potentially a fatal disorder. And so in order to prevent the future recurrences and to permanently cure an individual to sort of rebalance their immune system, then the second phase of treatment involves bone marrow transplantation. And um, so for patients that have severe mutations, it's obvious that they re require bone marrow transplantation to prevent future recurrences. For other patients in which we can't identify mutations or we identify mutations that are very mild and it's, it's very ambiguous as to whether or not um, they have a serious problem, uh, for those individuals, uh, it's less clear whether or not uh, one needs to go to bone marrow transplant. Uh, in fact, sometimes the best way to determine if you need to go to bone marrow transplant is to wait and see if the HLH comes back a second time. And if it does clearly come back, then uh, that's sort of the proof that you need that an individual needs to go to, uh, to transplantation. Now, uh, for the treatment of, of children with HLH uh, with bone marrow transplant, um, uh, if, uh, if they are in good condition, and our goal with the initial treatment is to sort of is to put out the fire of the uncontrolled immune response, help them to heal and um, be in good health. Uh, if they're in good condition, then going to transplant is uh, is still has significant risks, but it's definitely worth uh, those risks because the the risk of not uh, correcting the problem permanently can be uh, uh, can be uh, quite serious. The decision regarding 
going to bone marrow transplant can be very complicated, and it, it ultimately boils down to weighing the risks and the benefits. Uh, if uh, a child clearly has, um, uh, it's, if it's clearly inevitable that HLH will come back repeatedly in a child, then uh, the risks of transplant are clearly worth it. If it's not clear whether HLH will return, then, uh, uh, then it's not clear that bone marrow transplant is justified. And there's a, a large gray zone, and so that's a, a difficult uh, decision in many circumstances. So uh, HLH can uh, affect many organs in the body. So uh, it affects very prominently the bone marrow. Uh, it may affect the liver. Uh, and um, it may, uh, children may be sick uh, with damage to a variety of places in the body. But the one area of the body that can be affected that uh, raises the most questions about long-term effects is the central nervous system, so the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, and involvement of the central nervous system is quite variable uh, from, from one uh, individual to another. And um, recognition, early recognition of, uh, of inflammation in the central nervous system is essential for treating it. Uh, and so this is uh, an area that uh, it appears to most of us that uh, physicians are getting better and better uh, in terms of uh, recognizing and treating inflammation early before extensive damage occurs. Uh, we know from uh, studies that date back many years now that uh, there's a significant rate of uh, permanent uh, brain damage in children that were diagnosed with HLH, treated for HLH, and then went to a uh, bone marrow transplant, uh, and then were assessed years later. There's a, a, a significant rate of, an, of, um, of um, neuropsychiatric or neurologic um, issues that these patients experience. But it's difficult to say what the probability is now because, as I mentioned, uh, the worldwide physicians are much more alert to the, the possible um, damaging inflammatory processes that could affect the brain. Uh, and um, so while it's true that certainly some children still have uh, significant uh, permanent neurologic damage, uh, it's, uh, the, the frequency appears to be less than what it used to be in years past. The, really, the best way to assess this is, um, is for children, uh, after they've gone through treatment, uh, is really to have uh, neurologic assessments uh, performed uh, you know, when they are old enough to be, um, you know, neurologic and functional assessments, when they're old enough to be assessed well uh, in, terms of, um, in terms of their neurologic functioning. Uh, some children with HLH will develop uh, uh, liver failure, which is permanent, and requires liver transplantation. And this is a problem that was, is extremely under-recognized even uh, 10 years ago, in my experience. Uh, but it's increasingly recognized um, by uh, hepatologists or gastroenterologists who typically see children that present with um, what's called acute liver failure. But a number of these individuals, in fact, the liver is so destroyed before the diagnosis of HLH is made that they, in fact, require liver transplant. And so we've seen a number of patients in which receive a liver transplant and then subsequently the diagnosis of HLH is made or it's made at the same time but it's too late to save the liver. Uh, and so they've required liver transplantation followed by bone marrow transplantation for a, a permanent cure. Uh, and there are uh, long-term effects obviously of having a, a transplanted liver that are d quite distinct from, um, from bone marrow transplantation. Uh, and then the, the other answer, to, the third answer to your question is uh, the treatment itself. Um, so there are potentially long-term effects of the treatment for HLH. So the initial phase of treatment where we're uh, trying to control the damaging immune response, we rely heavily on this medication called etoposide. It is known that if individuals have uh, a high cumulative exposure to etoposide, that there is some risk of developing leukemia in the future related to that etoposide exposure. Now, a child that uh, receives a typical eight-week course of etoposide with a few additional doses uh, is actually in a very low-risk category, uh, but um, children that receive extended uh, treatment with etoposide or repeated uh, courses of treatment, there is uh, some real risk of developing uh, leukemia in the, in the future. Uh, but in terms of other long-term effects related to that therapy, there really are no... Um, well, I should, you might edit that, sorry. I would say that there, there's no clear um, uh, other serious risks uh, related to that long term. In terms of bone marrow transplantation, there are in fact many uh, sequelae of, of bone marrow transplantation that really depend upon uh, the toxicities that the patient experienced through the transplantation process, 
also whether they develop complications such as graft versus host disease after the transplant, uh, and that's really a whole other topic uh, that could be addressed by many hours of discussion.